So I know you've already been sitting here for some time, but it's also true that this has already been an eventful conference. Productive indeed, but also intense and painful for some. So may I ask that we take a deep collective breath together. Yeah? In case I stop breathing up here, you can help make up for it. Here we are on this final morning of the 10th ICAP. May we each call upon our ancestors now, both those ancestors of origin and those ancestors of choice, all who have come before us. We ask them to be with us today and inspire our future work as we prepare to go forth from here. It is one of the greatest honors of my life to be standing before you today, this remarkable audience. I, stand, I come here as a funder, and it's true that as funders, we are not the ones who do the work, and, it is, and it, is not, it, is, it is not my money. I stand in awe of the pioneering spirit brought to bear on the frontiers of the HIV AIDS epidemic in Asia Pacific. I admire the commitment and the smarts that each of you bring to this work. I also stand before you today as a gay man of Korean descent. And may I say on a personal note, it's especially humbling to be with you here in the land of my ancestors. So my fellow panelists and I have been asked to speak on one of the least sexy topics on the agenda today, the financing of the epidemic. Now, I've been asked to speak specifically on the corporate and the, and the philanthropic responses to HIV and AIDS. Now let's start with the basics. Philanthropy is about the art of donating money or the science of donating money. And some of you may know the word philanthropy if you look at the Greek roots of the word means love of humankind. We know that this love demands that our work embrace all of humanity, and especially those who are most marginalized and underserved. Let me share with you the words of the Reverend Martin Luther King, Jr., perhaps the greatest American prophet in our history. He says, power without love is reckless and abusive. Love without power is sentimental and anemic, and anemic means weak and hollow. He goes on to say, power at its best is love implementing the demands of justice, and justice at its best is correcting everything that stands against love. Ladies and gentlemen, through the lens of HIV AIDS, we know that this epidemic is not merely a, a medical condition, but one of the defining social justice issues of our time. I first came to this understanding some 18 years ago when I had the opportunity to study with the late Jonathan Mann. As some of you may know, he was the head of the first global program on, on AIDS, which, which was the precursor to UN AIDS. Dr. Mann is, is credited with pioneering the connections between health and human rights. In the early days of the epidemic, Dr. Mann had the foresight to recognize that unless we go for the jugular, and that's the vein right here, in defending the human rights of the most marginalized people in the context of HIV and AIDS, we will fail miserably in achieving our public health goals. Levi Strauss and Company and the Levi Strauss Foundation share this commitment to health and human rights, and specifically to the HIV AIDS epidemic. And before I launch into a bit of storytelling, and I hope this does not veer into the sphere of the glossy promotional brochure. You don't deserve that. Allow me to underscore that this is a simple story about the value of values. At Levi Strauss, we have four institutional values that serve as our guiding light, not only for our business practices as we try to clothe the world with these, with these products, like this, um, but, but more importantly, our response to the HIV AIDS epidemic and how we show up in community. Those four values are originality, empathy, integrity, and courage. Let me repeat them. Originality, empathy, integrity, and courage. Our response to the global epidemic dates back to 1982, even before AIDS 
took on its name. At that time, it was known as GRID, or Gay-Related Immune Disorder. Concerned that a mysterious but potentially deadly disease was affecting many members of their community, a group of Levi's employees in 1982 approached senior management, and that included our CEO, Bob Haas, who is the president of our foundation, to ask if they could distribute brochures in the atrium of our San Francisco headquarters. In their response, these senior leaders did not hesitate. We will not only allow you, but we will join you. This decision reflected deep concern that these employees would be become targets of extreme homophobia, homophobia. So the next day, they spent the lunch hour together passing out these brochures. And because of the presence of, of Bob Haas and other leaders, more employees than usual stopped to take and read these brochures. But more importantly, these employees understood that senior management had their backs, had their full support. Now, through the mid-80s, responding to urgent needs among our own employee base, aid support groups were formed within the walls of our San Francisco headquarters. Our CEO made it a habit of breaking silences among business leaders, insisting that AIDS was an issue not for those people over there, but one that demanded serious and compassionate attention in the workplace. So a year later, in 1983, the Levi Strauss Foundation made the first corporate grant in the fight against HIV and AIDS with a donation to San Francisco General Hospital's AIDS clinic. Over the years, more than $60 million in investments from the company and the foundation have helped build several HIV AIDS service and advocacy organizations from the ground up, first in San Francisco, but also in 30 countries around the world. But legacy is not enough, and being first and being original is not enough. At Levi Strauss, we believe it's in our genes, if you will, to have the courage to continually push the limits of the response to this global epidemic. We've sometimes raised a few eyebrows along the way, but as Jonathan Mann would point out, if you're not rabble-rousing and making a little bit of trouble, you're probably not on the right track. So six years ago, we became the first corporate foundation to support access to sterile syringes as the only proven method of preventing HIV among people who use drugs. How do we explain this as a corporation? Returning to our values, it's a simple matter of the integrity of the response. And five years ago, we made a commitment, again, based on integrity, to provide comprehensive prevention, treatment, and care to all employees um, there's there's 13,000 that span 45 countries, both high prevalence and low prevalence. But Levi Strauss is just one company and foundation, and we cannot tip the balance on our own. So let's step back and look at the big picture. We've seen the macro numbers, mostly of public funds, but what has been the corporate and the philanthropic response to the HIV/AIDS epidemic in numbers? So all sources, global, government, multilateral organizations and private philanthropy donated last year an estimated $16 billion to the response. The combined expenditures from corporations and foundations based in the United States and the European Union, that's where we have the data, most recently amounted to $750 million. So that means that private philanthropy, if you count corporations and private foundations together, and that includes the Gates Foundation, represents 4% of all the funds deployed to address the HIV AIDS epidemic. You don't have to be a mathematician to realize that this resource does not come close to addressing the needs created by HIV and AIDS. And AIDS, HIV and AIDS. So the question before us is this, how do we mobilize this 4% of the pie and drive outsized impact in the global response to this epidemic? Is this just a drop in the bucket or could it be a, a lever for pioneering change. I would submit to you today that the philanthropic and the corporate sectors, especially compared to government, are uniquely positioned to address pressing and politically sensitive issues that cut against the grain, especially given the connections between HIV and AIDS, sexuality, and drug use. All it takes is a dose of courage. 
From the very beginning, foundations have been responsible for key advances in HIV policies and program development. They have helped courageous voices speaking on behalf of the most marginalized groups to be seen and heard. They have helped support the creation of innovative organizations that governments were not ready to, to be able to mobilize and support. But despite this strategic opportunity, only 10% of all foundation and corporate funds support advocacy. And there's a growing sense in Asia Pacific and every other region that the bench for advocacy has diminished rather than grown in recent years. So in the time that remains, I'd like to propose four guiding principles to ensure outsized impact and to re-energize HIV AIDS advocacy. Now there are unique roles for business for funders and community members. But I think over 90% of the people in this audience are, are, are members of the community. And what I hope to offer is food for thought for, for people who do directly serve the community. So guiding principle number one, advocate and serve. Or if you will, serve and advocate. It's no secret to people in this room that HIV and AIDS is probably the most stigmatized condition in human history. We have twin epidemics. We have the medical epidemic, and we have a staggered epidemic of stigma and discrimination. Let us be reminded that each demands its own toolkit, and we need every weapon in our arsenal that we can get our hands on. Now, all the research about high-impact social, um, social sector organizations in the brave new world of this 21st century 